My dad was a primary care doctor, but took great pride in those days in also doing surgery, since most a good share of the surgery in this country was done by general practitioners. I must admit, I, I had no imagination as a child, and my, I admired my dad so much. And he was a physician who uh, seemed to really enjoy what he was doing, and so I, I can't imagine doing, I couldn't imagine doing anything else but medicine. And of course, I'm sure he encouraged me because he wanted his little boy to be a doctor. I went 20 miles away from home to school and I went to the freshman mixer. And I went with another boy I just met in the new dorm. And uh, we saw two girls, one short and one tall. And uh, so after the mixer, I, we both agreed we'd take these two girls out for barbecue or something of that sort. It turned out I picked the tall one and he took the short one. And the short one was Susie, <laughs> who ended up being my wife eventually. But uh, that's how I met her in 19 June of 42. And I got married while well, I was just before my senior year. And uh, we've been married ever since. In my freshman year, when I, as soon as I, soon as, I guess I was only 17 years old, I joined the reserve as a first year college student. First year was 12 months, and at the end of that time, they sent all of us reservists off into uniform. But they sent us to another college to prepare to be officers. So I went to Dartmouth, a place I would have never even thought of going to, for another 12 months. And by that time, I had enough credits to go to medical school. All the medical schools were feeling uneasy about their even right ability to get people in those days, since we were at total war at the time. So anyhow, I went to the University of Chicago. About the time the war ended, I was a senior medical student. So my military service consisted of four months acting as a corpsman at Great Lakes Naval Training Station at one point in this career and never getting anywhere near war. During the medical school experience, I worked in a research lab of a thoracic surgeon, one of the pioneer thoracic surgeons actually. William Adams was his name. And, uh, and I got so excited about surgical research, I finally decided not, not only do I want to be a surgeon, I want to be a thoracic surgeon. I worked with a fellow who thought we might be able to work on heart valves. And so we really developed a technique for mitral valvulotomy before it was ever done. So I was sure at the end of medical school I wanted to be a heart surgeon. And that's why I happened to go to Hopkins with Dr. Blaylock. I was about almost through my residency. I went to Korea as an army surgeon. And I was sort of relieved to go because I felt sort of guilty the whole time for having a free education, free medical school education, including GI Bill for the last year. Uh, and so it was sort of nice to be able to pay it back. I went to Memorial Sloan Kettering to learn to be a head and neck cancer surgeon, which of course, as you know now, is done mainly by ENT people. Uh, but I did train to do that there. Uh, I, nobody offered me a job except at Memorial, and they offered me a, a really good job there. So I stayed there another 10 years working at Sloan Kettering in the lab and, and uh, doing a lot of surgery. And so I, I really had fun there. I liked it. Most of my research had nothing directly to do with cancer, even though it was Sloan Kettering. Most of it was to do with uh, the physiology of various surgical procedures that we were doing for cancer. And so when kidney transplantation started, they kept saying, some of our patients ought to get transplanted. And Dr. Hume in Virginia and the Dr. Murray in Boston had too many patients. Why don't you do it? So I started doing kidney transplants in New York. I did all the early kidney transplants done in New York and did them at a cancer hospital. And that's sort of how I got lined up with Dr. Hume here. I played football against Dr. Hume 
when I uh, intramural football in Chicago, that fr freshman year I was there because I was on one of the one of the teams, and he was on the medical school team. He knew that I was doing some research in transplantation immunology in the lab, and he knew that I'd done some kidney transplants. So when he needed a new vice chairman here, uh, when Dr. Eggdahl left to be chairman at Boston University, and th in those days the vice chairman had to do a lot of work because Dr. Hume was out of town all the time, uh, so he decided to recruit me. And uh, I'm sort of glad he did, but I didn't remember the football business till I was sitting in his office and saw he had the same junky little diploma that I did. And then I met with Kenlo Nelson, who, uh, as you remember, was the dean. We were starting about 62, and I don't know for how long. And uh, uh, he said, oh, yeah, we need to have somebody there in the Department of Surgery to answer the phone, he said. <laughs> so, uh, and, but he also was intrigued I was from the cancer hospital because he thought we ought to start a cancer center here. There weren't so many full-time faculty members when I came as there are now. And a lot of private practitioners in town admitted their patients. When I first came, there was private services and staff services. And actually, partly because we started surgical oncology, I convinced Dave Hume to make all our services uh, theme-oriented rather than private versus clinic. And we began to expand our faculty, and we crowded out the private doctors, which they all blamed Dr. Hume for that. It wasn't really his fault, but he got the credit. And uh, this crowding them out like we did uh, d didn't help with town relations. But that same time, that same year, was when St. Mary's opened. And that was the first time they had a big general hospital here in town. Up till then, it had been all these little uh, family-owned, uh, uh, nice little cottage hospitals. I had always had an idea that uh, we ought to have a field within general surgery that focused on cancer. We were all called cancer surgeons there, but that didn't, that didn't sound very neat. So I thought we ought to start something called surgical oncology. The man I brought with me from my laboratory was Jose Turs. Uh, he was an Argentinian who was bright and energetic and had done a good job in my lab and was a good surgeon. And he said he had had a resident when he was working at the University of Buenos Aires that we ought to take as our first fellow, Hector Pablo Kurchuk. It turns out that we trained him. He went back to Argentina. He became head of surgical oncology there. He then became the professor. Then uh, the last, I was last time I was down there, he was president of their counterpart of the American College of Surgeons, Dr. Baer. Now the reason he was different is that he got his PhD in our division while he was a student. So when he came back for his fellowship, I figured I couldn't ask him to do another two years of research. I just put him on the faculty. As a matter of fact, his dad was Elmer Bear. Elmer Bear was uh, head of oral surgery in the School of Dentistry, and he was head of the Division of Oral Surgery in our department. Shortly after we got going, Elmer became our closest buddy. And actually, over the period of his life, he was one of my very best friends here. Hume needed a vice chair, as, as Ken Lo said, to answer the phone, and, and this was a smaller operation then. I didn't realize that he did anything except transplants and national things until he died, and I inherited his job as interim chairman for a couple of years and found out there were some things he did. It was harder work than it was before. He loved to have controversial discussions at conference. All his conferences were exciting. Uh, if if I, I had a patient that was a problem and I asked him to see it, he'd get so involved, he'd stay all night. I mean, he just, he just was so full of enthusiasm that he was worshipped by the house staff. 
So we initially started off with the idea of no cancer center, just have a cancer program where the medical oncologists, surgical oncologists, radiation therapists all collaborate in their educational thing, have a weekly tumor board, and all that sort of thing. I didn't really create it, I just sort of coordinated a gang that created it. Finally, Lauren Wood said, why don't you become director? And I decided, gee, I don't want to be an administrator and give up surgery. Surgery is my stick. Whatever you want, they said. So that's about the time Laser Greenfield came to take over the department, and I was appointed director in 74. Now, that was another one of these things like surgical oncology. People said, where is the cancer center? And it was the little party line I had always was, it's all around us. Because it really was just the collaboration of scientists, laboratories, people working together in a cooperative way. We, we had no building. Walton Turnbull was on the board of uh, visitors of VCU, and he was part of the small subcommittee that was going to help us raise money for building the building. And they also decided that nobody could name it who didn't give it $2 million. Well, as it worked out, uh, he also, in his bank job, uh, worked finan financial affairs for Mr. William E. Massey and convinced Mr. William E. Massey that this was something to donate to. He had a brother who had cancer and he was very interested in and uh, finally I told him one day, I said, you know, we got to name it the Massey Cancer Center, but we got to get two million dollars. And so he got lots of other members of the family to chip in, and it finally became the Massey Cancer Center when we got two million dollars. Of course, by the time we were building the building, we'd collected ten. I think I talked too much. That was the problem. <laughs> on the National Board, so I eventually ended up being president of the American Cancer Society about 1990. It did take a year out of my life a little bit because your job as president of the American Cancer Society was to give talks all over the place and beat on the drum, and uh, uh, you were a volunteer, and they paid your way everywhere, and they had you going all over the place, all over the world. But fortunately, all my partners chipped in and, and uh, took care of my patients when I was gone, which was a lot, and, and uh, took care of my, my responsibilities. When I, so, but it was only, one year was enough. The Cancer Center is, with, with the support of the departments, now has become a, more of a clinical unit. The one thing they focus on a lot is becoming comprehensive. There's a lot of places where we've reduced the magnitude of the surgery by adding well-placed non-surgical treatments. Breast surgery is the best example, though, as you point out, of it's narrowing down so it's all outpatient work. And uh, it, it's so much better. The, the patient satisfaction is better. The cure rate is a little better, too. I have a tennis court in my backyard which I built when my children, when we moved here, they were in high school, and I thought, how do you keep your children near home rather than out somewhere evil? So I, I built a wing on the house to put a pool table, and I put a tennis court in the backyard, and it really worked. Now I just invite young, young faculty members usually, because most residents don't play tennis, and I still play tennis a couple times a week. I, uh, I had to slack off a little last year when I had the aortic valve replaced. That sort of slowed me down a little. But uh, I, I'm able to play again now. Since I retired, which is over 20 years, I guess, I worked part-time at the VA. I ran a clinic out there. Now I share a clinic with Dr. Vu one day a week. I teach students out there, go to all their conferences, and say wise things, and I teach students here. I don't really work hard, I just act like I'm working hard. But I'm having a good time, because I found out that medicine and teaching students is what I like.